Welcome into Press Box Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles, flying solo tonight. Gary Stein has another assignment tonight, and I'll introduce my guest in just a moment. He's a good friend, Executive Director of Maryland Sports, Terry Hazeltine. He joins me in just a moment. Uh, I needed to tell you a little bit about the Costas Inn and what they want me to talk about because everybody in Baltimore knows the Costas Inn is the great place to go to watch sports, eat steamed crabs, crab soup, crab cakes, steaks, whatever it is you like. But during the pandemic, they realized an awful lot of people were not going to be comfortable coming back into facilities just yet. They have upped their game on their curbside. They are now one of the preeminent places around Baltimore to pick up your food and take it home and eat it in the safety of your own home. That's the Costas Inn. CostasIn.com is the website, 410-477-1975, the phone number. Tell them Stan the Fan sent you. Terry Hazeltine does join us now. Sorry to make you sit through that, Terry. It's okay. Did it, did it get your mouth watering for some of that great Costasin food? It did. It made me hungry. It made me realize that um, after this, I need to get some food. All right. Well, <laughs> you, we're going to keep you about 30 minutes, and then we'll let you get food. And I'll get some food as well. Awesome. Terry, uh, you and I have known each other for about 14 years now, I believe. And, and in that time, you've worked your tail off at really making Maryland a destination point for a lot of sports that it didn't previously have. Uh, this, this thing you were aiming for the last couple of years, uh, the World Cup, this is probably the enchilada. I mean, you're you're as executive director of Maryland Sports, the Super Bowl bringing one of those to Baltimore is probably not on your dance card, uh, but but the World Cup certainly was. On a personal level, how disappointing is this to you? Well, if you you rate on a scale of uh, one to ten, I'm in the negatives. Um, it was <laughs> it was definitely a blow. Um, I thought we as a team did uh, everything we could to to bring, you know, Baltimore's portfolio of, of being a consolidated footprint, uh, bringing, um, you know, our partners with the Ravens and the city alike in the state in combination with great civic and corporate partners, you know, put on a world class, you know, site visit back in in September. You know, obviously the Ravens Chiefs game the night before was, you know, a nice little cherry on top of the Sunday. All the conversations to date had been nothing but, you know, above board and, and the like. So we thought we were going to be standing there. You know, then when we joined efforts with D.C., we thought that was the combination one, two punch that would really put us over the top for Thursday's announcement. But, you know, obviously people had other other things that they had to you know contend with and they had to deal with, you know, Canada, and Mexico as part of this process, too. And, you know, there's some really great cities that are on that list and well deserving of being you know, uh, on that list. However, we think we're very well deserving and we should have been on that list. However, we'll find out more details as to why we didn't make it, you know, probably in mid-July sometime. But I just, you know, say to you, Stan, I'm just really, really proud of everybody who stepped up when we needed them to step up. I think we showcased the, 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 to, the together as one mentality as a city and as a state. And then when we added D.C., we really brought it, you know, together. And it just wasn't our night. As I said to someone else, I said, we got invited to the dance. We just didn't leave with the date that we wanted. Yeah. Uh, you know, it refreshed my memory because of the pandemic. Time is time is like a weird continuum right now, remembering things. What year did you start pursuing this? Because you were aiming for 2026. Was it about 2018, early 19? So we started working with the United Big Committee in 2017. Uh, putting together our portfolio uh, in order to make the bid book. Um, in June of 2018, FIFA announced the 2026 World Cup was coming to North America to the United Bid Committee. We were competing against Morocco at the time. Um, they named United States, Canada, and Mexico under that United umbrella as the host um, destination for 26. And then once they made that announcement in 18 is where we really had to refine because we knew there was going to be a limited number of venues in the United States. We knew that Canada and Mexico only had limited assets to provide. And then when we started seeing some things like um, after the bid was awarded, we saw Montreal drop out. 
We saw some, you know, stuff going on between Edmonton and, and Vancouver very late in the process. And then, you know, those kinds of things started to happen. And you started seeing a few cities kind of got a little bit quiet here in the United States. But we continued making waves and we continued to making strategies on our legacy plan, our human and workers' right plan, and everything like that. We just stayed consistent. Then we went over, you know, to England and, and met with the, the Football Association. Then our senior advisor, Bumi Janata, went you know, over to Africa and, you know, really evolved some relationships with Benin, Nigeria, and some other countries over in Africa. It really built a, a network of, you know, really good connectivity in the, the in the FIFA family and then the FIFA world, and that stuff started to build. And we started becoming what was an underdog mentality to start this thing out to being a true contender. And then, yep. like I said, we thought, you know, Thursday the 16th of June, we were one of those 11 cities going to be named. And you know, you were there with me. Yep. Um, obviously, it, it 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 took the wind out of the room. Um, and, no question about it. Um, and, and the like, but you know what, Stan, we got so many other things going on uh, across the state of Maryland, the city of Baltimore, that we should be really proud of. And we're going to focus our attention on those things. And, and you know, if FIFA comes knocking at the door somewhere down the road, we'll listen to what they have to, to say and, and figure out what maybe was the, you know, the shortcoming. But we have to be proud. We have to be very proud of the team and the effort that we put forward. And I'm not going to sit here and stew in it for too long because we got too many of the awesome things going on in the, in the state of Maryland and the and the city of Baltimore when it comes to sport tourism. So we just move on and, you know, focus our attention on those great things. I, I agree with you totally, but I do want to dig into this. Just a couple more questions about yeah. it, and then we will turn to all the fantastic stuff coming up on the calendar in the state of Maryland. Um, when you when you reflect on the decision by FIFA to go with a three country bid, mm -hmm. you know, in other words, instead of awarding it to the United States, to award it to Canada, U.S. and Mexico. Is that a trend that you think FIFA is going to move toward? What was the what was their reasoning instead of awarding it to either the United States or Canada or Mexico? You know, well, I think after the the 2018-22 World Cup kind of what some people call the debacle where uh, there was a major surprise in, in the envelope that was presented for 22. Um, regardless, they're doing everything they can right now to put on the World Cup, you know, here at the end of the year. So I uh, wish them the best of luck in, in, in what they're yeah. about to host. But, you know, it really, I think, changed the focus that we needed to figure out how to, you know, take on the CONCACAF region and present the CONCACAF region to FIFA versus just one country within that portfolio. And I think that was some of the intel that was probably received after the last process. And, you know, you've seen it before when Korea and Japan, you know, hosted the World Cup back yeah. in 2002. And some other places have talked about, you know, some regional bids over in Europe where Spain and Portugal talked about coming in together. You, you saw that England, you know, Ireland and Scotland, they were all looking at a, you know, an island bid up there and stuff like that. So I think you're seeing that you know, being able to spread the bandwidth of the event, especially now that it's going to 48 teams, um, there's only very few countries that can probably put on a 48 team Thank tournament you. successfully. United States being one of those, England and maybe some of the European and maybe um, some places on the Asian perimeter that could probably pull that off. But once you went to 48 teams, it really limited the scope of what one country could do. So coming to a regional approach or a multi-country approach or a multi-FIFA um, family approach, um, it's probably something you're going to see more often down the road. You and I have talked many, many times about this bid. And one of the, it, it wasn't what you were aiming for, but one of the things that was always a possibility was some of the ancillary events or hosting opportunities. Uh, as recently as about a week ago, we talked about this on the Glenn Clark show. Yeah. Uh, is that still, is that to, to be determined in the next couple of weeks? about yeah, think, what FIFA's still got in mind for the Washington and Baltimore bid? Yeah, I think, you know, that's what we, we're going to wait for to see. We still think there's possibilities to to be a part of this 2026 World Cup. You know, obviously, it's not what we were anticipating. You obviously go into this wanting matches in your building. That's what we were fighting for. Yeah. That was what we were contending for. However, we also know that there are other, there's other fruit on this tree. You know, there's the FIFA Congress. You know, we're one of the cities that were proposed in the original bid to be a, a FIFA Congress host site. 
you know, there's still base camps and training camps that still have to be assigned across the United States. You know, they still bring a lot of potential economic value to the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland. And, you know, Infantino said it on his uh, on the telecast, the thing that we turned off in our party because we just weren't excited to hear any more <laughs> of the news that, you know, that that event that we were talking down in D.C., the big national mall fan fest. You know, he basically said that that they're still going to move forward with that kind of concept because it doesn't affect the game. It's about how they can entertain guests from all over the world, still bring our nation's capital into the fold. So, you know, congratulations to our partners to the South um, for that perspective, that there's some engagement there, that there, something could happen in the nation's capital. However, I still think we got a card to play in this in this process and we got to keep our doors open, you know, as much as, you know, I would love to use some four letter words and, you know, slam yep. my head against the ground and just say, you know, you know, you know, piss off kind of attitude. Yeah, you know, the realization a, is that a it's still around attitude. a game that we really like and we want to yeah. see more action yeah. in our in our market. Well said, Terry. Well said. And I know how hard you worked on this thing. And I know what, a you know, on a personal level, it's yep. very disappointing. Let's turn to some of these other things that are yeah. pretty exciting that are coming up. Uh, in, in just about 10 days or so, right? It's at Towson, the women's, the 2022 World Lacrosse Women's Championship. Yeah, is yeah. 29th there. of June through July 9th at Towson and partnering with Goucher. You know, 30 of the best women's teams from across the globe will converge on the, the, the Baltimore region for some of the best women's lacrosse you can see globally. Um, and they're going to be here playing matches both at Towson and Goucher. And then there's also going to be a match or two up at the U U.S. Lacrosse headquarters um, up in Sparks um, on their you know beautiful facility up there. Right. So it's really going to bring you know what we're known for. You know, you know people say gold medals lacrosse and crab cakes kind of you know attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, we're bringing the best of the best in the women's game. We just got done hosting the women's you know NCAA women's division one lacrosse championships at Towson. You're seeing other lacrosse going to happen this weekend at um, I mean excuse me at Johns Hopkins. Uh, PLL yeah. going on um, at Johns Hopkins on the professional level men's side, you know, this weekend up at Johns Hopkins, um, going to be really exciting. You know, the PL coming here and bringing, you know, several teams to the market and um, playing that multi, you know, team event, you know, out there, it's going to bring the fan base out. You know, every time the PL has been here, the crowds have been tremendous and I expect nothing less. And we, we, again, will show the lacrosse world that, you know, Baltimore's the epicenter of the game not only with the PLL, but then with the world championships on the women's side. And then recently just hosting the NCAA women's division one to a sold out standing room only championship yep. game been North Carolina, Boston college. You know, I was there, I was, the crowd was loud. It yep. was awesome. And it just showed that the importance of the game of lacrosse to our market. So very proud of all of our partners who are out there in the lacrosse community, bringing that game to, to life here in, in Maryland. Uh, the dollars and cents of the World Lacrosse Women's Championship. How many people does that bring and what kind of e economic impact, roughly, you know? Well, you're looking at a, a multi-week you know, week event. Um, you, you know, like I said, the 29th of June through the 9th of, uh, um, of July, you're talking 30 teams, roster size anywhere from 22 to 25 with, you know, adding on some of their personnel. So you're talking, you know, 30, around 30 plus pe people per team. You're talking international travelers coming in to follow their their national teams. You're looking at probably an economic spin. We haven't done a true economic yeah. analysis on it, but you're looking at a, an event that will probably draw somewhere between nine to twelve million dollars of economic spend. You know, you know, on the greater Baltimore region through uh, the World Lacrosse Championships, and it could be a little bit higher. It depends on how well and now that some things have softened up with travel, how many international travelers really hit the market. Um. I know you were you and I were both friends of Tim Leonard, the former okay. AD over at Towson. You you like that venue, don't you? For things, uh, you yeah. think that could be more used, don't you? Yeah, you know, this this stadium sets up well. The campus lays out well for you know multi you know sporting events. You know, obviously the stadium's at a good capacity that allows um, us to do some unique things there. I mean, when Tim was there, we were talking about you know, long-term relationship with the NCA potentially and doing some things to the stadium that would allow us to get up to like where Harford is capacity size, somewhere in that, you know, upper 20s, low 30s, where the NCA men's lacrosse championship, you know, shows that's about where it needs to be from yeah. a size capacity. 
when you put that event in a major NFL stadium, it just creates a vacuum environment. Um, and, you know, we could, you know, the attendance is good for what the, the event is, but, you know, putting 70 plus thousand people in, in a stadium for a championship um, over Memorial Day weekend, um, I think it's time to change the model a little bit. And um, we've advocated for that because we talked about doing a multi men, women's, you know, switching and rotating yeah. over the course of a period of time. So we could justify the development around that building to help, help that. Now we're not saying it's off off the off the table. It just it's been pushed back a little bit of time. There's been some transition. Yep. There's some things that we have to do to you know build up that relationship again. You know on campus now that you know there's you know new leadership there on, in the athletic department. But we're, we're always excited when we can talk about lacrosse. You know and we can talk about the the world championships. We can talk about um, you know, their, their football program and the track program and the things that utilize that facility. But Towson's done a tremendous job building their athletic portfolio with CQ Arena and the like. So we look forward to any chance that we have a, uh, an opportunity to work with Towson on bringing major events to the market. Have you met Dr. Stephen Eichenbrot yet, the new I, athletic director? I have not met personally. But it's on my radar to make sure this summer that that does happen. Yeah. Um, like I said, you know, we're having obviously some new personnel at a few universities across the um, uh, across the city, and looking forward to. It. I met the new AD at, at Morgan State University last Thursday. Uh, look forward to working with her on the AAU Junior Olympics coming in 20, uh, 2028 and twenty thirty two, with the main event being at Morgan at track and field. So she 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 was you know outstanding first meet. You know, I wish that I could have talked to her. I talked to her before the announcement, but didn't get a chance to get back to her because obviously I was not in a, a, a frame of mind to really want to talk to too many people. I, I, hear, <laughs> I, hear. I was chuckling before when you start talking about 28 and 32, you know, uh, do you ever get blown away by that? Like when you were, when it was 2017 and you were starting to talk about the World Cup 2026, you're going to be nine, 10 years older. You know, it's, it's amazing how fast time goes when yeah. you have that type of calendar. Well, you know, we're, we're also a contender for the 2031 and 2033, you know, uh, world rugby um, mm -hmm. championships, men in 31, women in 33, you know, look at, um, you know, congressional has already been awarded the Ryder cup. And what is that? 2038 or something like that. It's like, right. So when you look at some of these events that are looking so far into the future, it tells you a couple things. One, very competitive market. Yep. Two, that when they see something that they like, you know, and the calendar in their rotation doesn't currently have an opening for you, they want to figure out because of how you present yourself, how you present the city, how you present the assets that are available, they want to figure out a window of opportunity that works for you. And what I'm really excited about the AAU Junior Olympic Games coming here, it's 28 and 32, which are Olympic years, which mean that attendance will be up, kids will be jazzed up about seeing track in the olympic games they want to get out there same thing with the other uh, eight to nine sports that will be hosting in concert with the track and field event so our our numbers will be elevated because we're part of that whole olympic year and the fact that we can use the olympic games the junior olympic games as part of the vernacular just adds to the cachet and thanks to visit baltimore and their team for their partnership on that one um and you know that's the thing build partnerships build relationships get out there, meet the people we need to meet and make sure that we represent the state of Maryland and, and the city of Baltimore at the highest level and show that can-do attitude. You know, one of the things I didn't have on my list to talk about, the CIAA yeah. tournament, uh, because of the problems with the pandemic the year before and all that, uh, you guys have announced an extension yes. to, that, to that. Is it a two-year extension? Yes. That's, yes, that's it was great. basically making up for the two years that... Um, we worked through the pandemic in concert with the CIAA. We showed, you know, obviously good faith that you know, we're committed long term. Yeah. As I joke with someone, I said I would love it to have been a 10 year extension, but obviously, you know, the conference has to take the steps that they need to do to, you know, to do what's right for the conference. Um, really proud of Al and the team and the city and you know, the folks that stepped up, Frank Ramish in the arena, and now with you know Oakview Group coming in and doing the remodeling on the arena. You know, it's going to look like a whole new place. You know, when the, the teams come back this year, they're going to think they're in a totally different city uh, because of the, the remodel. But, you know, those those type of events that add up and that can connect with the community. And and what I'm really excited about some of the events that we have on the radar and the, you know, the cycling classic and the five, they're far beyond just the competition. We're talking about how are we making impacts in the community? 
How are we helping the next generation, you know, have a better place to live, work, and play? Introducing them to job opportunities, introducing them to educational platforms, um, introducing them to, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, through the use of sport as a platform, giving our younger kids a place in some underserved communities a chance to touch, you know, a soccer ball for the first time or touch a, a you know, ball in general for the first time. So the, the bigger legacy pieces of these events is really what makes me excited and, you know, makes me feel proud that people are connecting to things just beyond the field of play. And, and it's adding to our community, it's adding to our quality of life. And that's important stuff when you look long-term to well, how we have to raise the city and try to change the narrative of what might be. We're, we're going to uh, get a guest on in a, in a couple of weeks about the cycling classic, but tell us a little bit about the cycling classic. Again, due to the pandemic, it pushed to this year as its first year. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, where does it take place? Uh, how mm -hmm. many people will view this thing? How many participants? Yeah. So you're looking at a, a, a pro series event. It's the highest ranked um, professional cycling event in North America in 2022. So to come out of the gate and be at the highest ranking right out of, you know, shows that you know, the UCI and U.S. Cycling have a lot of faith in us. You know, the event will start up at Kelly Benefits up in um, Sparks. Um, they'll do about 70 plus miles up in the, the you know, the beautiful countryside, you know, of the county, come down um, into the city uh, late afternoon. So we're talking about a 1.30 start up there coming down into the city about four o'clock and doing five to seven circuits, you know, in the city in a, in a, a 12 kilometer loop um, and finishing right on Pratt Street, right uh, at, at Marketplace across from Phillips uh, Seafood in that area. Okay. Uh, we're talking about 17 pro teams, teams that, you know, ride in the Tour de France. As a matter of fact, we, had, we just signed our fifth world tour team, which for a first year event, people are blown away that we have that many world tour teams already committed to our race. We'll have 17 total. And we're talking about 70 to 100,000 people lining the streets of Baltimore wow. City and County to watch, you know, big time cycling. But again, the bigger asset to this entire event, Dan, we have a community day on Thursday. We're going to be out in Patterson Park, bike jam, doing things around the bike, showing, the, you know, the, the importance of the bike, bike safety, helmet, you know, helmet giveaways, you know, maybe some bike giveaways. We're working on some strategies to make sure that you know, kids, and then leaving some of those materials back to the schools and the community mm -hmm. so that kids through the physical education programs and their after-school programs can access to a bike and those type of things. And then we're having an introduction of the teams on Friday nights. You know, we're working on the details on the list of that. I don't want to give away the location yet because we're still fine-tuning and refining that location. And then, you know, on, on Saturdays, a, a charity ride up in the county called the Bridges of Hope, um, tied to the United Healthcare, who's our presenting sponsor. Um, and it's a, a ride of various, you know, levels and skills and distances so that people um, who are novice to the bike can still participate, don't have to go as far. And then those people who are really passionate about it, you know, can ride and they're going to be on the same course as the pros. So they get a chance to feel the road, see the terrain and be a part of that environment. And then that night, we're doing a thing called the Night of Champions, where we're going to bring in some legends of the sport, some legends in, in sports to talk about you know, some of the things going on in the sports space, everything from, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the growth of cycling, and also just talking, you know, you know, around mental health and what's going on in the mental health industry as these athletes, you know, get out there in communities and like, so a lot of different moving parts, but we're really excited to bring, you know, an event of this magnitude, you know, to, to Baltimore, Baltimore County, Baltimore City in, in 2022, and we're hope this will be a, a flag pole event for uh, many, many years to come, you know, like the Preakness. We know the Preakness is every, you know, you know, third weekend in, in May. We hope that Labor Day comes synonymous with the Maryland Cycling Classic. And the great thing about the cycling event, we can alter the things year in and year out and, and change it up one year to the next, whether it's a start in Baltimore and we go out somewhere else or vice versa. You know, we have the flexibility to really, you know, maneuver this thing so you can always get a different look and feel year in and year out. So we're we're fired up about the Cycling Classic. You know, King of the Mountain Marketing and uh, Metal Sports are doing a tremendous job. And John Kelly, as our honorary chair, is just out there pounding the pavement every day, making sure that we have the, the tools and the resources and the assets to deliver a, a world-class event. One of the other events I know you you take a lot of pride in having a lot to do with bringing it here is that uh, five-star event out in, that is in Cecil County, correct? That is correct. Fair That's enough. Yep. Just past Hartford County. Yep. Um, it's beautiful out there. I went out twice last 
year. It's a, it's a ride, but it's it's well worth it out there. I know the attendance last year is first year of the event. You're you're trying to attract a lot of new people because there's a there's a built in audience already. Yeah. I think you had about twenty twenty two thousand total people over the three day event uh, yeah. last year. Is it four days or three days? It's it's called three day eventing, but it happens over four days because That's dressage right. takes a little extra time, and you got to make sure that everybody has a fair time to a, a quality um, arena. So right. you have to you know make sure you're um, maintaining it a little bit more. So it takes two days to do the 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 dressage um, aspect of the event. You were thrilled with the 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 way that the event was executed last year, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. If you look at the way the venue laid out, and you go back to some of the schematics that we looked at when we first started pursuing that event, which feels like an eternity ago. I I can't even go back and count. It just feels like I've been working on that one what, since. What birth. year? What year did you start that one? Like 15? 15? 15? 15. Jeez, yeah, was... you know, when we took the horse park system study and we analyzed it to figure out what we could do. But, you know, in all fairness, you know, we had for an event that 45 days out, we didn't know whether we were going to have spectators or not because of COVID. Right. Yeah. To be able to put 22,000 people out there and people oohed and awed over the venue, people oohed and awed over what we were able to deliver, yep. you know, in, in a coming off of a pandemic year. I'm fired up for the team you know, for this coming year, 22, to to showcase, you know, there'll be a couple tweaks and modifications, things you learn after year one, but we, we're we're going to go on sale here in mid-July with our with our tickets. We just, you know, we're, we're holding off a little bit, you know, just because, you know, we're trying to stabilize a, a few things. You know, the venue is, you know, being tweaked a little bit um, and wanted to make sure all those things were done and tweaked before we went on sale. Cross-country course is a little different um the arenas got a little bit of a makeover of things we learned with them so let those things come to completion before we you know go on sale so look forward to a big announcement in mid-july about everything going on sale you know celebrating the equestrian space in the maryland five star and the maryland four star that happens simultaneously and the young young event horsing event that happens over that same weekend you know proud of the team again Oh, you got a good team there, there Jeff. Whatever it is, awesome. You, you brought Jeff Newman, and he did a great job last year. I know you're happy and, and assembled him. a great team and some great people to help us behind the scenes. That you might not have heard their names, but they were back there doing all the work and making sure that you know we walked out of there on Sunday night after the event, going job well done. People walked away happy. Yeah, we were kind of like Disney. What happened behind the scenes, no one needs to know about, but what happened out in front of the audience was first class so so i show off my knowledge the cross country track it, 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 did you end up getting some complaints within the the horsemen uh, the the eventers that it was too challenging is that, that what because uh, i know that there were some reservations by riders about that yeah so we you know ian star created a very tough course yep um some things that we learned until you you know have a large group like you have with the five star traverse over the course you don't know where some of the strains on the course could be you know so we got a chance to evaluate after year one you know one of the things that we learned is because the terrain is it's deceiving a lot of ups and downs that we had to alter the finish so that it's not an uphill finish last okay. year you didn't realize it but there's a little great uphill and when you're done the, what the horses have done that's a little bit too taxing and then you shift it around and this year you're going to see the course go through the arena Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll be able to utilize the arenas on Saturday as well. So all that infrastructure can be utilized, you know, as you saw this last year. Yeah. Because of the finishing of some construction, we weren't able to bring the cross country course into the inside of the track because we we're just allowing things to mature. Uh -huh. uh, this year we've adjusted and now you're going to see some of the cross country course, you know, traverse through the arenas and back out to some of the stuff you saw last year. I got a lot of ground to cover. You got five more minutes? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Army-Navy football. Awesome. Uh, again, you were part of bringing it here that first time, and it's become sort of we're, we're never going to probably have it like Philly had it, where it was almost every year. But it's kind of broke the log jam. They moved the game around a lot more, but you're in the mix again. Mm -hmm. and you're you, We've got it here in 2025, correct? That is correct. Um, you know, great effort by all the partners, MSA, the Ravens, um, uh, Visit Baltimore and the city and the state coming together 
to make sure that we put the, the best case forward why Army Navy needed to come back um, to M&T Bank Stadium and Baltimore City. Um, you, you saw this time, Stan, I mean, they went to five totally different cities with Philadelphia being on, on the end. So it's the first time and I, that I can recall that, you know, it didn't go somewhere and then back to Philly for a year or two. It's actually, it's going to be down at FedEx. It's going, it's going to be like Boston. It's going now. to be yeah. with us. Yeah. Um, it, it's going to be in New York and it's going to be in Philadelphia. So five years where they gave it to five different markets. I mean, that, I think that's the first time ever that Philly wasn't at two out of the five or three out of the five in the equation. So your counterpart in Philadelphia must have had it. When that announcement came, he must have felt like you did with the World Cup. Well, I, mean, I can was... tell you this. Uh, Larry Needle does a tremendous job up in Philadelphia. He's a good friend. Um, you know, we kicked him on the Army-Navy game a little bit. And then, you know, he got the chance to kick us right back on Thursday night when he got announced for the World Cup in uh, 26. So yeah, um, I'm doing the juggling act. I, they're both great events. I'm proud of both opportunities. I wish they had both been announced at being yep. in this market, wow. but you know, it's a game and it's a competition and you can't win everything, Stan, but you can try like hell to, to do it. Hey, one thing we haven't talked about in a long time, and it's because of COVID and all the shutdowns and everything, mm -hmm. the, the amateur events like the lax uh, lacrosse events and like out of Timonium and all that. Um, yeah. What are they called? I can't even remember the name of lax splash. Black Splash, you have Hogan Lacrosse. Okay. You have, those, you have, have you those legendary, been, you know, sports now. It's in the lacrosse game. Elites in the lacrosse. Yes. Yeah, so have, yeah. have those been going on the last three years, every year? Mm -hmm. So during the, the pandemic, we created a, a you know, return to play document about how we get back to youth and amateur, you know, sports safely. You know, mm -hmm. one of the, the positive things that came out of the pandemic, Stan, is that, and I think I shared this with you before, all levels of sports were talking to each other. Professional sports were talking to youth sports. Youth sports were getting a chance to talk to just trying to learn best practices so that we could figure out how to get back into action. Yeah. But the the sport tourism industry at the youth and amateur level never truly went away. There were some shutdowns and some modifications, but not to the like you saw in a lot of the collegiate and professional levels. Okay. Because at the end of the day, quality of life is about giving your kids opportunities to to get it physically active yep. to participate. So we did everything we could to make sure that we created a safe environment, got kids back. But I can share some data with you that would show that, you know, yes, youth and amateur sports trended down during, you know, the pandemic. But, but nowhere right near when the doors open, the line went straight through the roof. And we are right now in the process of surpassing 2019 numbers when it comes to economic impact and the number of events in market. So we were doing 200 and you know 25 to 250 million dollars each year in direct spending on Maryland's economy. I bet we're triggering right now towards that 325 to 350 range just because the number of events that come back online and the elevation of participation because everybody's been pent up not playing, you're seeing record attendance at youth events where events that were 100 teams are now 125, events that were 300 are now 350. And et cetera. And you're seeing this kind of explosion. The challenge is, is you run out of capacity after a while. So there's only yeah. so much threshold that you can reach. But we are targeting right now across the state and industry wide um, ahead of uh, 2019, which is a, a record high. Unbelievable. Yeah. Hey, getting back to the new refurbished rehab, uh, Baltimore Arena. Yeah. Will, will the new arena, will it allow for NCAA basketball events? It will open the doorway to have a conversation um, about early round stuff. Um, okay. Kind of like Dayton, that yep. kind of, you know, yeah. I mean, that round would be great. And, and the women's tournament and, and, you know, D2 and, you know, others. But we'll be able to be in the conversation now because the assets that will be available to the building and you know, the Oakview Group obviously has a great relationship across the country with the various buildings that they're, they're, they're taking ownership or management of. Um, so, that network alone will create opportunities to, you know, to converse about it, but it does open a gateway for us to be part of the conversation, you know, which we haven't been able to be a part of for many, 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 for many long years, time. long before I ever got here. Yeah. Hey, couple last things. Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned the Ravens several times and you haven't mentioned the Orioles. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot asking you anything to do with the lawsuit between Lewis and, yeah. and the family. 
Yeah. But I do want, he threw something into it. And I know you've gotten to know John Angelos yeah. and you know how he negotiates. Mm -hmm. Has he ever given any indication to any state, you know, party that, hey, if you don't do this, I might pick up and move, you know? No, I mean, um, a matter of fact, the statements have been exactly the opposite. Um, you know, we were there, I think you were in the room when, when he said, as long as Fort McHenry's, you know, protecting the Inner Harbor of Baltimore, the Orioles will always be in, in Baltimore. Um, I, I, I believe that's the case. Now, I'm not as intimate with those discussions as the leadership of our board yeah. and other officials are, but um, in my conversations, and you know, they're few and far between, but he's always been upbeat and positive about, you know, that team being in, in you know, the Orioles being here in Baltimore. The team, the front office has always been engaging about being in Baltimore. So, um, like I said, I'm and, not and following. Playing a like, and playing a role at elevating the city. Yeah. You know, in um, it, it, yeah he's, he's proud. The team's proud of yeah. being a part of, you know, the city. You know, they have still, you know, the best ballpark that was ever built for baseball, you know, in Oriole Park at Camden Yards. We as a statement authority are really proud about our relationship and helping keep that facility, you know, to the standards that it is, you know, we're starting to see some fun dynamic stuff happening on the field of play watching last night cycle, you know, got hit for the cycle. That's cool yep, stuff yep. with Cal in the building, watching it. You Maybe know, he could be a spokesperson for the Maryland cycling classic. Yeah. Austin Hayes. Yeah. Cal, Cal likes to ride. Ray Lewis likes to ride. I mean, yep. there's all kinds of people out there that like that, that are hidden riders of bikes and, you know, love to see them come out and be a part of it. Because like I said, the cycling class is a huge engagement of just multiple people come together to enjoy the spirit of the bike. And, oh, by the way, there's going to be this really cool professional cycling event that goes on Sunday that traverses. So where's the really cool part about the cycling classic? We have the schedule because the way a, an event like that works, the cyclists are going to hit the city right as the game is letting out. So that the fans that are at the ballpark can also, you know, take part and watch some of the best cycling in the world post game. Very cool. Make it a whole day, and it's a holiday weekend, so no one has to go anywhere Monday. So we're just, you know, making sure the city's alive over a holiday weekend. And congratulations to all the bride and grooms out there that get married that weekend, because there's a heck of a lot of weddings going on in Baltimore um, Labor Day weekend this year, wow. which is not a norm. Just it's a COVID, you know, yeah, new thing, but. Labor Day weekend is usually not a wedding central weekend. I did so not know congratulations that. to all the bride and grooms. Hey, last question I got for you. You you were hired by Martin O'Malley, Governor yeah. O'Malley. And now you've been through Governor Hogan's two, you know, two-term tenure, and it's going to come to an end pretty soon. I don't need to bore the audience, but a lot of times political appointments, and you were not technically and not a political appointment. Uh, although you were appointed by a politician, yep. uh, they would leave for you, you, your position to, to be moved if a Democrat would win, they'd hire somebody else. Early on, I know you worked at that because it was important that there be continuity in your position, yep. uh, and, and you got that continuity. Do you, do you want to comment, though, on Governor Hogan, what it's been like, what, he's, what kind of partner he's been for, to work with? Oh, um, he's been fantastic. Uh, the Maryland Sports and the Sport and Entertainment Corporation, which are two things that I'm intimately involved with. One is our connection to the stadium authority. The other one's our nonprofit arm. Um, he gave us, you know, the tools and the and, and the resource that we needed to be successful, you know, over the last several years. He, he, he couldn't, you know, obviously the pandemic set everybody back. Um, and I can't fault. And he did a tremendous job leading us through a very challenging time. But you know, Tom Kelso, who's the chair of the stadium authority, um, has been um, a lightning rod in our world with the support and, you know, the the kindness that he shared to, to our office about elevating us, making sure that, you know, we were in in these fights to win them. I mean, you, you can't do that if you don't have people backing you. And the fact that we had our World Cup, the lieutenant governor and the mayor, you know, right there showing leadership from the city and the state. The fact that we have his support on the cycling class is the fact that, you know, he understands the value of, of sports and the sport tourism space and the economy of it. The fact that we were able to create the Michael Aaron Bush Youth and Amateur Sports Grant Program, you know, under his watch, you know, now that we just passed the major events funding legislation, it shows that this administration was really committed to the territory in which I oversee for the state 
and they they invested in it and they're committed to it. But the MSA board has been tremendously um, involved and very supportive of me, which comes down to that they had the support of the governor and his administration to make sure that, you know, my office and the things that we're doing get the support that they need to be successful. And I, I thank him for that opportunity. And I look forward to whatever is ahead of me, whether, you know, whoever's in office. Um, yep. I think my office is apolitical. Um, I think we're here to do the good work on behalf of the citizens of the state of Maryland to ensure that sport tours and that industry is well served and has a reputation across the industry domestically and internationally that people want to come to Maryland and participate in sport and you know, tour around this state and see really cool things. And it's been a pleasure and it will continue to be a pleasure as long as I have the opportunity to serve in this office. Well, you've become a good friend over the last 14 years. I appreciate years, that, Dan, and, you too. Uh, and we, we view you as a, a partner uh, in a lot of different ways and uh, appreciate it's mutually, the work Yeah, done. it's mutual, Stan. Yep. And I want to I want to take this moment to thank you and the Press Box family for all the things that you've done during the World Cup bid and yep. during the Five Star and other things. You've always been, you know, doors open. Let's talk about things. Let's come to you know, common ways that we can support each other throughout this effort. And that's that's the type of family and you know, environment that I wanted to create through this office when it was yep. created, because it's partners like you that work with us to ensure that, you know, we're mutually elevating the, the genre of sport. Yep. And in my world, sport tourism, and you've been right there at the table from the get-go, Stan, as I said to someone, I think you're my second or third cup of coffee when, you know, I came to the state and you've been there. Um, as you know, as a, a cheerleader and a, a supporter from day one, and I'm just as blessed to have, you know, been connected to you and the the press box family as um, it probably goes the other way too. So thank, thank you. you for saying that very much, Terry. We'll look forward to talking to you again sometime down the road, not too far, and uh, oh, helping to promote some of these things that we talked about. It's an exciting time yes. in the state of Maryland. Yes, All it right. is. All right, we'll say goodbye to Terry Hasseltine, and then I'll tell you about, you don't have to sit there and watch me do another ad, Terry. Terry Hasseltine of the Executive Director of Maryland Sports. I just want to tell you one last thing about the Costas Inn. Costas Inn, there, you got a bigger picture of me telling you about the Costas Inn. Located 4100 North Point Boulevard, they are a great destination, whether you're comfortable sitting in a restaurant right now or restaurant and bar watching your sports on the screens, the multiple screens there, eating your steamed crabs, your crab cakes, steaks, salads, great desserts, having a libation or two. But if you're not that comfortable with that yet, uh, Costas Inn has really stepped up their game over the last two years and built uh, one of the most dynamic curbside uh, takeout venues that you could imagine. Go to the website, costasin.com. The full menu's there. You can call in your order, 410-477-1975, and uh, pick it up. They pack everything so great. You're never going to have the soup pouring into other food, uh, you know, commingling all that food. Costas Inn, one of my favorite places in town. They've been with me for, get a load of this, They've been with me for 22 and six, like close to 30 years. The Costas Inn has been supporting Stan the Fan and Press Box, uh, and we support them. All right. Love the Costas Inn. Um, that does it for this week. Just got word that Ross Grimsley will not be with me Monday night. We'll see what we're going to talk about on Monday night. Uh, but I do know that next week, we are going to have on next Thursday night, Gary Stein will be back and our guest will be D.P. Smith the third, And the book is The Golden Arm Gentleman. Another book on Johnny Unitas. We'll find out what D.P. Smith's angle is on Johnny Unitas and why he calls him the GOAT, uh, despite all the amazing things that Tom Brady's done and Joe Montana. Uh, D.P. Smith the third says he's the GOAT. Uh, that's it for tonight. We'll talk to you soon.